Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. I invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to Job. I, we're going to have a recording of this, and we're not going to have the scripture on the screen, so you're going to need to follow along in your Bible or in your Bible app. Job, if you, go to, if you have your Bible, go to the middle and turn left. It's right before Psalm. If you're using an app like I use, it'll be in the middle of the Old Testament books. So Job, it's considered to be the longest of the oldest book in the Bible. Written before, you know, the Bible is not in chronological order. Written before Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, who was written, those were written by Moses. This book is considered to be the oldest book of the Bible. It's there in the middle. And let's listen to this story, this true story that had happened with Job. A man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Job's first test. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from? the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing, with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Chapter 2 Job's Second Test One day the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. 
Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil, and he has maintained his integrity, even though you urged me to harm him without cause. Satan replied to the Lord, Skin for skin. A man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence, and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Wow, you thought you had a bad day this week, huh? We've had the shootings down in Florida. There were parents who lost a child. But Job, on that day, not only lost all of his possessions, his wealth, but all of his children on that day. We're continuing in our series that we started last week on worship from A to Z. And we're actually going through the alphabet. You look at each letter of the alphabet and corresponding that with an action. And we're trying to teach you that worship is more than just what we do here on Sunday morning. Worship is a lifestyle. The Bible tells us we're supposed to worship continually. I've been here throughout the week. I haven't seen you all here continually all week long. Worship is more than just singing. You can't sing continually. Worship is an attitude. Worship is something that we can do continually if we understand the true meaning. And as we said last week, worship is an antidote to worry. Worship is also an antidote to when we've been wounded. Worship is is an antidote to when we've been wounded. For worry, we have a choice, either worship or worry. And when we've been wounded, we have a choice too. And that choice should be to worship. Everyone goes through wounds in their lives. You know, you've heard the story or the saying that our mothers taught us or we learned somewhere in school, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That sounds nice, but you know what? I fell off my bike a bunch of times learning how to ride. I fell off even more learning how to ride it backwards. <laughs> Some teens, I think, have seen me ride a bike backwards. It's a lot of fun. You sit on the handlebar, and you just pedal like this. It's a lot of fun until you fall. Um, I've had a lot of physical injuries. I don't remember those, but there's been things that people have said that I still remember to this day. How about you? You're no good. You'll never amount to anything. Um, uh, who, who does he think he is? Who does she think she is? Um, we call that bullying. There's things that have been put up on the Internet that has caused so much hurt and pain that people have taken their lives. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but sometimes words hurt even worse. And so what do you do when you are wounded? Well, we worship. How can you do that? How can you connect with God when you're wounded? Some of you have had a crisis this week. Some of you are carrying wounds right now. There are some things that have flooded your mind as we've been talking and sharing that have come and memories that you have that you have been scarred by. What do you do with all of that? 
Well, we're going to share some things you can do with that. And I guarantee you that if you follow these principles, you're going to find healing, you're going to find some freedom, and you're going to find some relief from the wounds in the past that have hurt you and haunted you. So what do you do? Well, take out your sermon notes and write this in. The first thing you do when, when you are wounded is you grieve. You tell God exactly how you feel. When you're in a crisis, when you've been hurt, when someone said something bad about you, when you've been criticized, whether fairly or unfairly. I'm always amazed when people criticize me unfairly because there's enough things they could do that I deserve criticism. You don't even need to go to the unfair criticism to criticize me. I make enough mistakes. Stay with those. But whether it be fairly or unfairly, they criticize you. And, and you just, what you do is you grieve. You unload your feelings to God. You share with God. This is actually a part of worship. Job did that. It says in Job chapter 1, Job stood up, he tore his robe in grief. That's a Middle Eastern tradition. Tearing your robes was a symbol of frustration, anger, depression, and deep sorrow. He shaved his head and it fell to the ground and he worshiped. When we feel anger, why is this happening to me? That's usually one of the first responses we have. Anger. Why did this happen to me? And then when we're wounded, when we're criticized, when we've gone through this, sometimes we, a shock. I can't believe this has happened to me. And then we feel grief. Look what I've lost. I've lost a friend. I thought he was my friend. I thought she was my friend. I thought he was my boyfriend. I thought she was my girlfriend. I thought he, she was my spouse. What have I lost? I maybe have lost my confidence. You see that with sports players. And maybe they've heard something from other players or maybe in the coach and then they get the ball and they've lost that confidence to shoot that next shot. We can lose our confidence. And then we feel fear. What's, what's going to happen next? If this has happened, what's going to happen tomorrow? We have all these emotions. So what do we do with it? Do we suppress it? No, we express it. We tell it to God. Don't be like a Coke bottle all shook up because eventually you're going to explode. When I take my emotions and I swallow them, and I bury them down deep, guess what? My stomach keeps score. How about yours? Yeah. God wants us to express it, to tell us. In chapter 7, verse 11, Job said, I can't be quiet. I'm angry and I'm bitter and I have to speak. He was confused at first and then he's complaining to God. And then he's actually accusing God. God, why did you have this happen? You can do that with God. Jesus did that with God. He said, my God, my God, why? We can ask. He questioned God. He got mad at God. But Job kept trusting God all throughout it. And that's why at the end, God says, he's my boy. He's my man. I don't know if any of you who are parents have ever had this happen to you. But sometimes my children question my judgment. That probably never happened to you. <laughs> but it had happened to me. They questioned my judgment on things. Uh, they never questioned if I loved them, but they questioned whether I was right. And of course I was right. Because Kathy told me I was right. I was just going with what she said. <laughs> so I knew I was right. You know, it's the same way with God. We don't question, hopefully we don't question whether God loves us. If you question that, just look to the cross and you can say, God, how much you love me? And Jesus says, I love you this much. But sometimes we question his judgment. And guess what? It's okay to ask the questions. God, why? Why did this happen? God, I'm angry. God, I'm frustrated. Are you ever going to do anything? Half of the Psalms, three-fourths of the Psalms are like that. Look at the Psalms. Lamentations says, 2.19 says, Cry out in the night. Pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. Just a minute 
honesty is the best policy. Uh, there was others in the Bible who doubted God, who got frustrated with God. Jeremiah was one of them. He said, oh Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me and, and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. He was just being honest with God. Naomi one time said, don't call me Naomi. She responded, instead call me Myra, for the Lord Almighty made my life very bitter for me. She's accusing God. She's saying, God, God did this. He made my, the name Myra means bitter. He, God, you made my life bitter. King David in Psalm 80, 85, uh, 88 says, For as long as I remember, I've been hurting. I've taken the worst. He's talking to God. I've taken the worst you can hand out, and I've had it. Be honest with God. God already knows how you feel. This is a part of worship, confessing, expressing your grief. In Psalm 116, David, David said, I believe, so I said, I am completely ruined. That almost sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. It's just saying, without God, I'm completely ruined, and I need God's help. It's showing dependency. It's showing that you are hopeless and helpless without God. And Job is at least saying that. He's saying, I believe in God. I believe God loves me. I believe God can handle my frustration. And he's saying, God, I believe. So I'm telling you, I think this is terrible. I think it's all over. The Good News Translation says, I kept on believing even when I said I'm completely crushed. So the first thing you do is you go to God and you tell God how you feel. And we're going to do that this morning. And I've asked Pastor Jim to come and lead us in, in prayer and for us to tell God how we feel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we know that many of us in this sanctuary have gone through some kind of grief or are going through some kind of grief. And we know, Father, there are many of our people who are diseased. They suffer daily, and they suffer through the things that they're going through. And here again, we think about Job. We think about his life. We think about what he went through, not only losing members of his family, but with, with the boils that he suffered with for so long, Heavenly Father. But, Father, what, what comes to my mind and the wonderful thing that comes to my mind, when I lost my wife, the biggest thing that came to my, my, li my wife, to my life, is me concentrating on the fact that I need to worship God. I need to tell him how I feel. In all of my anger, I said, Lord, I don't understand. Why does this have to happen? We are so young. But I, just as I told somebody a while ago, the Lord knows the future. He knows the things that, that are coming, the days that are coming, the things that we're going to have to face in the future. And sometimes... As, as, as hard as we, have, as much as we hate to grieve, as much as we hate to go through the hard times, he prepares us for the things ahead. Like Pat sang so wonderfully this morning, he, sometimes he takes me in the valley. Sometimes he puts me there so that I will learn, so that I will know, so that I can prepare my heart and my mind for the things to come. So, Father, I pray for everybody this morning that's suffering through some kind of grief, Maybe they've lost a loved one. Maybe they've lost their spouse. Maybe they've lost a child. Maybe they've lost a friendship. A lot of things can happen, Father, but we know that if we bow down and if we say, oh, Jesus, even though in my anger, even though in my frustration, Lord, I know you are still in charge. I know that you are still king of kings. I know that you are still Lord of lords. And I pray that you'll bring me through this and you'll help me through this and you'll give me the strength that I need through this. And most of all, and most importantly, that you'll help me to learn something through all of this that I might be able to help someone else in their grief and in their time of disappointment. Thank you for what you're going to do for our people. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you, Father, for how you brought me through. And I thank you for the victory that I feel now in my heart and in my life. And we give you the praise for everything. And all of God's people said, amen. Praise the Lord. 
G in our alphabet, it means grieve. To express to God what you feel. H is honor. Honor God in the middle of your pain. What does that mean? That means you praise him in spite of the circumstances. That's the second way to get over a hurt, to get over a wound. First, you admit, life stinks. Life is awful. This is unfair. And then you honor God. You say, God, I'm going to praise you in spite of the circumstances. You've heard people, you ask them how they're doing, and they go, well, and they always talk like that, don't they? Well, under the circumstances. Well, why are you under them anyhow? <laughs> honor God in spite. In spite of the circumstances, I trust in God. In spite of how I feel, in, sp in spite that life stinks right now, I trust God. I'm thankful to God. I praise. You don't praise God that you, life stinks. You praise God for who God is, that God is your provider. He is your, your comforter. He's your counselor. He's going to walk this through you, with you. You don't know that God is all you need until God is all you have. And so you, God will walk this through you. Friends, I would rather have God with me and have trials or have problems, have health issues, have pain, have suffering. And I hate to say this, but I'd rather have that than go through life Everything's roses without God. God is everything. Amen. Billy Graham, who died this week, he said he wasn't afraid of death. He was just afraid of how he was going to get there. And I think that's the way for all of us. We don't want to go through suffering. And some of you have gone through suffering. Some of you have seen your family members go through suffering. But we can honor God in the spite of that. And that's what Job did. The, the, the big thing about the book of Job is this. He continued to praise God in spite of, in spite of bad things. He, he didn't give up on God. He worshiped God if, when everything went wrong in his life. And my question for you is this. Will you do that? Will you worship God even when things go wrong? bad. That's the ultimate test of faith. In verse 22, 21, it says, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I shall have nothing when I die. In other words, I brought nothing into the world, and I'm taking nothing out of the world. The Lord gave me everything I have, and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming the Lord. The point is this. God says, I want you to trust me. And there's a lot of things you can praise God for even when your life is bleak. And I have those there on your outline. You can praise God that he's good and loving. You can praise him that he's all powerful, that he knows us every detail of your life, that he has every hair numbered on your head. And for some of us, that's not so hard. That God's in control, that he has a plan for my life, and that plan is a good plan, and that he will protect me. Amen. Most of you have heard me talk about Pastor Joshua James, this man that God brought into my life, and, and he, was, he looked like uh, he was 87 years old, and he looked like he was 57. Amazing Jamaican man who had moved to Liberia in the, in the late 50s and built all sorts of palaces and roads and highways and stuff for the government, then retired and became a pastor and, and had planted over 35 churches. And this man came to my life, I remember him telling me during the Civil War there, and these children soldiers would put a gun up to his face and say, we're going to kill you. And he would look at him and say, if you kill me, that's all you can do to me. <laughs> he knew that, his, that God was going to protect him because... He's just passing through this life. He was just going to get to his final reward a little bit quicker. That's confidence. That's faith. 
My question is to you, if you were to lose everything, would you still trust God when things don't go right in your life? Will you be like Job who says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I asked Mike to lead us in that song. We sing on Sunday nights at times. We have a service. He's coming. We have a service tonight, prayer and praise service. This is one of the songs we've sang in our church before. It comes right from this passage of Job. Let's sing it together, and let's sing it to the Lord. Amen. Church, stand with me. Bless his name. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundant flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out on, turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name.
Good, you may be seated. So how do we worship when we are wounded? First, we grieve. We tell God exactly how we feel. Secondly, we honor God in the middle of our pain. And the next way we worship when we are wounded is to invoke. Invoke, ask God for strength and wisdom. The word invoke means that, that you are, you're depending on a power that is greater than yours. When we have an invocation for uh, uh, a, a, a graduation or, or uh, an invocation for uh, uh, when we elect the president and, the, and then we bring in the president, when they have an invocation, that is invoking, that is calling out, that's asking God for strength and wisdom. One of Job's friends said in verse, now Job had these three friends. And they did something really good for a while. I think it was for three days. They came and they sat with them and they just shut up. They didn't say a thing. And friends, that's the best thing you could do. When someone's going through a crisis, you don't have to come up with anything profound and anything deep. It's the ministry of presence. Just being there with them. But that didn't last and they started to open up their mouth. You know, when was the last time a dog gave you verbal advice? <laughs> but we call dogs our best friends. Dogs became man's best friends by wagging their tail and not their tongue. Right? right. And that's what you need to do. Wag your tail more often. <laughs> Just be there. The ministry of presence. As a matter of fact, if you read all the book of Job, there's some things in there that are like, huh, basically it's, it's defeating a, 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 a thinking that was way back then and is still prevalent today, that if you do, if, if you, tragedy and pain and problems come your way, then you must have done something bad. You must have sinned. You must have done something against God. And there's people back then who believe that, and there's people today who believe that, and Job, this is a story about here, the most righteous man on earth, and he didn't do anything bad. He didn't do anything wrong. He, he even prayed for his kids. He offered up sacrifices in case they might have sinned. And here all this came upon him. And so when you read the rest of the, the book, and you see these friends, and when they start opening up their mouth, some of that stuff is, is just nonsense. And it's bad advice. And don't you use it to someone. Just give them the ministry of presence and love. But there was a few places they did say some things that made sense. And in Job 5.8 it says, If I were you, I would call on God and bring my problem before him. That's what we need to do. We need to invoke God's power and his wisdom and his strength. You see, when we get wounded, the reason why we need his, his wisdom and his strength is because when we get wounded, we don't think right. We don't, we start thinking weird things and start doing weird things. Huh? Yeah. I know. How many of you have seen someone else do something weird when they were hurting? Let me see your hands. How many of you were that person? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, we need God's wisdom to know what to do and his strength to do what we should do. In Job 12, it says this, True wisdom and real power belong to God. From him we learn how to live and also what to live for. You learn how to live and what to live for. You need wisdom when you're wounded. The Bible says in James chapter 1, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Ask God. NIV says he gives generously without showing favoritism. Ask God. This next verse, Psalm 3, 5 says, I can, lay, I can lie down and go to sleep and I can wake up again because the Lord gives me strength. You know what happens when we're not getting strength from the Lord and wisdom? We don't sleep good. We roll around in bed and our mind keeps going, rehashing, 
trying to figure out what we need to do and we don't sleep well. God says when we get his wisdom and we get his strength to do his will, we can actually sleep better. There you go. So tonight, instead of watching some television show, maybe read your Bible before you go to sleep. Maybe listen to some worship music before you go to sleep. Maybe pray before you go to sleep. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for strength. You know, one of the things about sleep is this. It's, this is kind of a cool one. It's free. <laughs> Do you ever think about that? It doesn't cost you anything. It's free. So use it. God has given us cycles. And seven days, God takes a rest. He wants us to take a rest. It's not good that man works seven days in a row. Get a rest. Come and worship. That's what we're doing here. First Chronicles 16.11 says, Go to the Lord for help and worship. When we say hallelujah, that's a Hebrew word for praise the Lord. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. Go to the Lord for help and worship him. The fourth way to worship when you're wounded is join and gather with others for support. Gather with others for support. Join with them. Don't wait until you're hit with, with a big, serious problem to find friends. You need friends before that happens. And you need to be a friend before that happens. And here's where we're going to put in about small groups. You need to be in a small group. You need to be a part with some others that you can depend upon, that you can call upon. They can pray for you, and you can pray for them. But here's the problem. I see it as a pastor. It frustrates me. Someone goes through a crisis. They go through a wound. They go through a hurt. And you know what they do? Stop coming to church. Well, I just needed some time to myself. And then... That goes one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month, two months, three months, and all of a sudden, where's old Charlie? We need each other. The Bible says that we are to carry one another's burdens. How can I carry your burdens if you're not here for me to carry? How can your small group carry for your burdens? How can your Sunday school class carry for your burdens? How can people in the church carry for your burdens if you're not here? So often we get people who, who want us to carry their burdens, and one of the questions I want to ask them, well, what small group are you in? They look at me as like I'm their small group leader. And now they have a need. I can't meet all of your needs. You need one another. We need the body of Christ. We need to gather others for support. One of the advices of Job's friend, another one said this. He said, don't let your anger and the pain you endure make you sneer at God. In other words, don't blame God. Your reputation, your riches cannot protect you from distress. You know, the, here's the thing. Physical pain affects all of us. Whether you're Joe Schmo or whether you're Bill Gates, the hospital gowns fit the same. And physical pain is no respecter of, per of people. And it comes and it hit us. And I don't care how wealthy you are or how good looking you are. It hits all of us. Money can't protect you from that. So be on your guard. Riches cannot protect you from distress. Nor can you find safety in the dark world below. In other words, turning to the occult. Be on your guard. Don't turn to evil as a way of escape. And friends, there have been many people who have turned to evil for escape. I'll turn... Well, my wife's sick. Well, God will understand if I have an affair. Um, my husband just doesn't show me affection, but this guy in the office, he talks to me. We see it all the time. I'll just, we, you know, hard day at work, and we see it on television, and they go, they go to that, that bar and, you know, hit me up with that shot. Give me another one. 
and we drink it away. People use drugs, people use sex, people use pornography, people use all sorts of things to escape. Be on your guard. Don't turn to evil as a way of escape. Join with others. This is the place you need to be. This is the spiritual hospital. Be here. God's power is unlimited. He needs no teachers to guide or correct him. Others have praised God for what he has done, so join with them. J, join with others. Gather with, with others. Psalm 63, 2 says, So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. That's what we're doing here this morning. We're here in worship, and we're, we're drinking in his strength and his glory. One of my jobs as a pastor is to pray for you, and I want to do that right now. There are some of you that are going through some really difficult things, and I want to pray for you. There's some of you that are in pain, even as I talk, physical pain that isn't going away. You feel the throb. You feel, you feel the pain even all throughout the service. There's others that your heart is breaking. There's things that are going on right now in your life with loved ones or relatives or, or relationships, and your heart is, is, is broken. We have, there's, there's teenagers, there's, I mean, I don't think there's anybody here who wants to be a teenager again. You know? Not today. And I, I used to think it was this hard to be a Christian when I was your age. But guess what? God's grace is always greater. But guess what? Now it's like this hard to be a Christian today. But guess what? God's grace is even higher. But you've got to rely on God's power. And you may be going through something right now. Or you may be thinking about something that someone else is going through. And and I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to ask you to pray. I would like, if you're going through something right now, would you just stand? And I want to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, as my friends here are standing, this beautiful and this wonderful congregation, and some can't stand because of physical illness, and I see that hand, I see those. My heart goes out to them. I love them so much, Lord. These people have been real examples to me, Lord. They've been really models of, of Christianity, of what it means to follow Christ. Their lives do count. It counts for me. They are the salt and the light of this world. And I thank you, Lord, for each and every one of them. And Lord, you know what brings them to their feet this morning. And if you're beside someone, why don't you just place your hand on their shoulder or pat them on the back, let them know that you're praying with them. We're joining with others in prayer. And Lord, today we're joining in prayer, Father, for these around us that we love so much. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us as we carry their burdens. We lift them up to the throne of grace. And we ask, God, that your grace that we call amazing will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. I ask, Lord, that your grace that you said is all sufficient will, will be all sufficient for them and that your power will be made perfect in the weakness that they're in right now. Oh, God, that you would just, you would just break through the fog and the darkness and you'd bring light and your power and your deliverance where it seems to be impossible. God, we ask that you would, you would make it possible. Father, where it seems like that nothing has changed, that God, that after today we've prayed that you will make a change, Lord. Father, for those that we're praying for who are lost and our loved ones who are lost, we ask, God, that you'd bring the right people in, the, in, in their presence, Lord, to draw them unto yourself. Father, for those who are in financial uh, difficulties, we ask, God, that, that you, would, you would meet their needs that you have promised according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Father, for those who are in physical pain, your word says that you went about the villages and the, and the towns preaching the good news and healing 
every form of sickness and disease. And my word tells me in Hebrews that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I ask, dear Lord, that you would come and you would bring your healing touch for those, Lord, who need to be touched by the Master. Lord, they're standing. For some of them, this standing may be like that lady who just said, if I, if, I, if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Oh, Lord, let this, their standing, be their faith in you, expressed in their faith in you and their dependence upon you for your touch. Father, for those relational issues, Lord, you've told us that we are the ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. And that we are to reconcile as you are reconciling the world to yourself. And so, Lord, there's nothing that seems to hurt worse than when relationships go, are split and are divided and are lost because you've put within us this desire to be reconciled with people as we're reconciled with you. We're made complete and connected with one another. So we ask God that you would build the bridges that separate us from those, Lord, who, who there may be a division, there may be a separation, there may be um, bitterness, there may be uh, discord and, and, and disharmony. And Lord, that you would bring these things together and you would bless that person, you would heal their hurt, Lord, as well. And you would reconcile us, Lord, with those that we really love and we care for. Father, for those, Lord, who are hurting because of someone else and someone that they love, I ask, God, that you would just stretch out your hand and perform miraculous signs and wonders and healings in the name of Jesus so that all may know that you are the God, the real God, the true God. And, Father, for those, Lord, who Satan, as we read here in Job, is that, is that comes up to the throne of of grace and the bible says in revelation that he's accusing the saints day and night he hasn't changed he was doing that back then with job and he's still doing it through the end of the bible and father for those who hear the accusations words that's been said in the past i pray lord that you'll give them the grace as you gave the apostle paul he said forgetting what is behind he put an ing to that forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And Lord, they will be able to do that. And Lord, you will take the burden of the past off their shoulders even now as I pray. And they might fail, feel the fresh wind of your Holy Spirit. And they may hear your voice saying, you're my child. You belong to me, and I love you, and I'm proud of you, and you're my servant. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. We believe that you're going to make things different because we've asked, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Finally, the K that we're going to look at is keep on. Keep on keeping on. Keep on. Keep on trusting God. Job 2, we, we heard this this morning. Job's wife said to him, Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Job replied, You talk like a godless woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and, and never anything bad? And all this, Job said nothing. You know, I don't get this. <laughs> God allows Satan to take everything out of Job's life except a nagging woman <laughs> or a nagging spouse. I'm like, come on, God. <laughs> you know? Um, notice Job's response. He says, though he slay me, though God slays me, yet I will trust him. You know why? You know why Job was able to do that? This is a verse I, I, I share it at every graveside that I do. It's because of Job 19.25. Job says this, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. He had confidence that my Redeemer liveth. My Redeemer lives, 
and he will stand. I've read the final chapter. This is the oldest book in the Bible, but he already in his heart, in his faith, he had read the last chapter before it was even written, and he knew that his Redeemer stands. His God lives forever and ever. Isaiah 59, he said the same thing. Then a Savior Redeemer will come to Jerusalem and to the people of Jacob who have turned from sin, says the Lord. We need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. Isaiah 56, 3 says, All of us have strayed like sheep. We all left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and the sins of us all. Why could Job worship when he was wounded? He held on to the promise of a coming Savior. Jesus has come. He's coming again. He's coming again. Are you ready for him to come again? I guarantee you this. A hundred years from now, none of us will be here. Right? Am I right? Yeah, a hundred years from now. Now one person in here is going to be here. Where are you going to be? Job was trusting in his Redeemer. I pray if you haven't made Jesus your Redeemer, do so today. Do so today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for this story. And we thank you, Lord, how we can praise you even when we are wounded. Someone once said that if we treat people like they're hurting, we'll be treating most people in the right way. And most of the time, so many of us and those around us are hurting. Help us to worship you in the middle of the pain. To say, the, the, the things may come and go, uh, the God gives and he takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, for those today that have never asked you to be their Savior, their Redeemer, I pray, Lord, that they may say, Jesus, I have gone my own way. I ask you to forgive me for going my own way. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior, my Redeemer, and that I will follow after you. Forgive my past, my mistakes, my sins, my selfishness. I accept your good plan and purpose for my life, and I, too, look forward to my Redeemer coming and standing upon the earth and taking me to heaven. He is my hope and my future. Father, this morning, we all say that on Christ the solid rock we stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. Our hope is in you, and in you alone, and we worship you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to be here tonight for our prayer and praise service. That's Five o'clock, five o'clock tonight, and you will not be disappointed. God bless you. You are dismissed.